יש לנו את דוקטור רן בן בסט, שעשה את הדוקטורט בטכניון אצל רועי פרידמן, ועכשיו הוא עושה פוסט-דוק בהרווארד, יש לו הרבה מאוד עבודות יפות בתחום של תקשורת מחשבים וסטרימינג אנגוריתמים, כל הדברים של heavy heaters למיניהם עם רנדומיזציה. בסדר, אני אשתמש בזה. תודה. גמרנו פה על איזושהי בעיה טכנית ושמחים מאוד לארח את רן פה. קיבוצניק מ... תודה, שאני אדבר בעברית, באנגלית. anybody... anybody want me to speak in English or... עברית. עברית, בסדר, היברו איז אוקיי. מה שאתה רוצה. אוקיי, אז אני חושב על זה בעברית, אז אני אדבר בעברית. Go ahead. Um, and thanks you for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. Um, is that working already? Okay, great. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about how to leverage uh, new types of switches that are programmable to doing network computations. And today we live in the big data era, right? So we um, send more emails, watch more videos, higher definition videos, uh, make more purchases. And All of this means that the amount of information is growing and fast. And to support this growth, we have faster line rates, right? So if we think of uh, the line speeds of the network compared to 20 years ago, they are 400 times faster. Um, maybe five years from now, we will have four times what we have today. And what isn't changing, or is roughly the same as it was 20 years ago, are the size of packets, like the units of information we send over the networks. And this means that the amount of time we spend on each packet is going down. And um, if you want to do the processing of packets in software, or you want to analyze the traffic um, in software, it's going to be uh, more challenging going forward, because um, the CPU performance is not scaling up as fast. So if you think of Moore's law, which I'm sure you all heard of, we're actually falling behind the last two decades or so. And the amount of power um, for a unit of area is going up. And if you believe Paolo Gargini, um, the chairman of the IEEE organization that roadmap these advances, uh, we are not far from the physical limit. So he says that in like five years from now, we will reach the limit, uh, after which we will no longer be able to um, shrink the transistors and put more of them in a chip. So uh, the CPU processing is really getting to the limit. We, can't, we don't expect to see a lot of um, improvement over time. So at the same time, so we have uh, more packets. The CPU are not improving as fast. Um, but we also want better network telemetry. And network telemetry is about uh, understanding the traffic and um, analyzing it. And we always wanted network telemetry, but right now we need better telemetry than ever. And this is for a few reasons. Um, one thing is that the networks are becoming uh, more and more complex. So if we have some problem and we don't have very fine-grained telemetry, Analyzing it and finding the cause for it, it becomes a problem. Um, but there are some new challenges. Um, so we have new trend of what's called self-driving networks. So these are networks that are supposed to run themselves. So if there's some problem, they're supposed to diagnose it and deal with it. Maybe scale up, scale down, shift some traffic around and solve the problem. And the idea is that we want to get the human factor out. Right, so we don't want uh, human errors, but we also don't want to wait for a human expert to analyze the network and find a problem. Uh, so for this to work, we really need better telemetry. And I'm going to get into what is exactly telemetry and some uh, uses of it later in the talk. Um, but why we need that is we have the self-driving networks. We also have another trend, which is right now, if you want to do some attack over the network, you don't actually need any expertise or any hardware. You can go online. Uh, there are services called booters. So these are like hire hackers that you can hire. 
Uh, you pay them some amount of money, you choose your victim, the attack type, and they'll carry it out for you. And they spend a lot of time and effort uh, making these attacks uh, more complex. And we really need better telemetry to figure out what's the bad traffic and mitigate these attacks. OK, so what can we do about it? I'm going to give you um, four different directions. I'm working in all of them. I think each of them is suitable um, for different scenarios or different use cases. And the first is approximate measurement. So uh, many times we don't actually need to know um, in 100% accuracy um, everything about the traffic in the network. And like you know, in many other domains in computer science, if you want to approximate a problem, um, you can usually get away with algorithms that are much more tractable computationally. And that was the focus of uh, my PhD at the Technion. I had a lot of works on that. Um, and the second approach is to redesign um, measurement algorithms for speed. So if you're working on network monitoring or even like uh, general streaming algorithms, um, you know that the main target that we optimize for is usually space, right? We ask something like, what's the minimal number of bits we need to solve some problem? Um, but it turns out that if you want to do this processing in software, if you want to push the limit of what we can do using CPU to analyze the data, um, we can come up with algorithms that are not as space efficient, but are much more lightweight in terms of CPU. So we can really push um, what we can do with CPUs. A third approach is to design more expressive algorithms. And what I mean by that is we have many different types of telemetry information that we want. Um, and you can come up with different algorithms for collecting each of them. Uh, but sometimes it's, it makes more sense to come up with fewer algorithms uh, that you can um, query in a more expressive way to understand um, how the traffic looks like, and I had a couple of works on that. And, a four, and the last approach is if software is not fast enough, then we should use hardware, and we should use new uh, technologies for programmable hardware. So this is hardware that we can uh, program, and this is the focus of uh, my postdoc, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. OK. so. What are these new hardware um, technologies? So I think all of you have heard of, F of uh, GPUs. Some of you um, probably have heard of uh, FPGAs, th those that are doing machine learning, um, maybe used TPU, tensor processing units before. And today I'm going to talk about another um, hardware architecture. And I'm going to talk about programmable switches. So like traditional switches, uh, these are really optimized um, for both throughput and latency when processing packets. But unlike uh, traditional switches, um, we have some programmability uh, to them, and we can um, use that. And this is rather new. This is maybe exists five years now. And um, I'm going to give you an overview of one of uh, the most popular uh, programmable switching architecture. It's called the PISA architecture. And it all starts when a packet gets to the switch. And packets, in general, have um, two parts. The first part is the header. This is the information that the packet carries so we can know how to route it. Um, it has the source and destination. Um, for example, we can check on the router if the source is allowed to send to this destination. And we have the payload, which is the content of the packet, the information. So this packet goes into a parser. The first step, uh, sorry, into the switch. The first step is a programmable parser. And the programmable parser allows us uh, to specify what are the fields that we care about in this packet uh, for the processing on the switch. So for example, we may want to look at the source destination protocol and look up the access control list to see if it is allowed. So once um, the packet gets to the parser, it extracts the values of these fields and puts them into what's called the packet header vector. So this is the vector of values for the fields that we care about. And now this vector is going to go through a pipeline. 
And the idea is that on each stage of the pipeline, we can do some computation. Um, but what's important here is that the, one, is that the pipeline is uh, one directional. So it means that once we're done with a stage, we cannot go back to it. And once we're done with the last stage, the packet's going up, so we can um, do no more computations. And the switch also has memory. Um, and the memory is partitioned between the different pipeline stages. And this was done for performance, but it is also very limiting. So, for example, if we're on the first stage, we cannot access the memory of the second stage. And when we get to the second stage, we cannot go back and write to the memory of the first stage. Right, so this is a limiting um, factor here. And once the header uh, went through the entire pipeline, uh, we may have changed its content. Uh, we can do some computations based on the other values. We can use the memory. And we um, end up with a different vector. And the last step is a deparser, which takes this modified vector with the original packets and uh, creates the sequence of bits or the modified packet that we're going to send out. OK, so why is it challenging to run algorithms on these um, hardware architectures? So we already talked about uh, the partition memory, uh, but it also turns out that you can only access one memory address per stage. So it's not that you can run an entire algorithm on one stage. Uh, you only have access to one uh, memory location. And you can also do basic arithmetic operations, like you can do bitwise operations, you can do addition or subtraction. But even things like multiplication, you cannot do on these switches. And the reason for that, so even if you think of a CPU on a laptop, you should know that multiplication takes more CPU cycles than addition. Right? And since these switches are designed uh, for minimal latency, so this was an informed decision not to support any of uh, these uh, operations to keep the latency minimal. And we also have limited amount of resources. We have limited amount of memory. We have limited number of stages. So memory can be like a the order of uh, megabytes per stage. And we have, let's say, tens of stages. And the actual numbers uh, varies between different switches. But these are really uh, small numbers in both of them. And this is only a partial list. So these switches have a lot more um, constraints. But these are the ones we're going to care about in today's talk. So today I'm going to talk about two projects that we do with uh, PISA switches. The first is Cheetah. And in Cheetah, we try to accelerate database operations. So we think of the switch as a hardware accelerator. And we show how um, we can use it to accelerate databases. And the other work is Pint, which is our attempt of making better network telemetry using programmable switches. So let's start with Cheetah. So Cheetah tries to accelerate databases. And as you may know, databases are used everywhere. This is how we store the big data. This is how we uh, process the big data. Facebook is running uh, more than 30,000 um, queries every day, scanning through petabytes of data. And since there's so much interest and money in these databases, they are extremely optimized for performance. So there are different um, databases, database systems that are used for this processing. And in Cheetah, we chose to try and accelerate Spark. And I think all of them have roughly um, comparable um, performance, I would say. But for us, Spark was the easiest to modify and benchmark. So this is why we chose Spark. This was only f this was from a networking paper, and I think this may only be related to analyzing the networks. Um, OK. So first question is, why programmable switches? Right? So we want to accelerate databases, want to accelerate Spark. Why programmable switches? So if you think of it, you're going to run some query on large amounts of data you're not going to run it on a single server, right? You're going to run it on multiple nodes. And in Spark, they're called workers. And these workers are going to do some computation locally. Um, but they're going to s communicate with each other, send information around. And all of this information is going to go through a switch, right? So unlike um, hardware accelerators that you would put on one server, 
the switch can actually see all of the traffic that's moving in the network. And this allows us to offload a lot more of the computation. And this is a huge advantage uh, for the switches. But it's not only that. So if we compare with FPGAs, and these are now the standard for hardware acceleration for databases, um, then it turns out that switches are much more efficient for moving data around, both in terms of uh, power and the purchase cost initially. And when we compared with a lot of different hardware targets, um, switches are much better in terms of both throughput and latency. So the main problem here is that they are hard to work with, um, but they are much more efficient than any other alternative. Yeah? When you say equipment, because earlier you said that they are very limited in the operation. Yes. So Yes, so this is about moving data, right? So they are much more efficient in moving data, but they are much more hardware to compute anything on them, right? And this is what we want to do right now. But before we're going to get into our approach, I'm going to give you an overview of Spark, right? It's, it all starts when a user sends a query. And the query goes into what's called a query planner. And the idea is that there can be many different algorithms for executing the query. And the query planner comes up with the best execution plan, or try to come up with the best execution plan for this query. And everything from now on is going to be an example, because there are many different ways of how Spark works. Um, but this is a common way that Spark executes queries. And in this way, we have one special node that's called the master node, and we have a bunch of workers. So the data is going to start at the workers, on the RAM of the workers. And the way Spark optimizes the performance is it tries to do everything in memory, so no disk accesses, no anything like that. And it also tries to uh, minimize the data movement. So anything I can do locally before sending the data, I should do that. Um, so the master would send the workers the query together with something called a UDF, or user-defined function. So this is the function that they should run locally before sending the data. Right, so the workers um, run the UDF, send the process data to the master. The master aggregates the data and send it to the user. Let me give you an example. Let's say that we want to compute the set of distinct items in a large multiset. Right? So this UDF can be a function that removes all the duplicates from the worker part of the data. But then um, all this data is going to go to the master, and the master may still need to do some processing, may still need to remove the duplicates uh, that exist across different workers, right? OK, so in Spark, all of the data between the workers and the master is going through a switch, but the switch here is passive, right? This is what we want to change in Cheetah. And first, we want to understand what are the bottlenecks of Spark. So in our experiments, what we saw is that there are two main bottlenecks for Spark. The first is this UDF. Um, so maybe not for distinct query, but for more complex queries, like maybe high dimensional queries, Skyline queries. Uh, this can take a while. And the second bottleneck is the master node itself. So once it gets the data, it wants to aggregate it. Uh, this can also take a lot of time. So this is what it looks like. We benchmark Spark for uh, different types of queries. And we saw that really most of the time Spark is going for computation. And this is what we want to improve in Cheetah, right? So we want to offload the computation from software, from the CPU of both the workers and the master, to the switch. But like I mentioned, running algorithms on the switch is not that simple. For example, we don't expect uh, the switch to be able to remove all duplicates. Right, in this distinct query example. So we came up with what we call the pruning abstraction. And the idea is that the switch is going to discard some of the data, to prune some of the data. But we want that the part that is not pruned, whatever gets to the master, if we run the query on it, we will get the same result as if we ran it on the original data. All right, so this is um, an overview of Cheetah. So we're going to have the workers master and the query planner. But now we're going to send the plan to all the parties involved, including the switch. Now, Cheetah is transparent to Spark. So the workers think they're going to send the data to the master. 
Um, but on the way, we're going to take the data, pass it through a module we call uh, the Cheetah Worker. The Cheetah Worker will format the data in packets in a way that the switch can read them. This is how we're able to run algorithms on the switch. The switch will decide which entries to prune and which to send to the master. In the master, we will have another module that reformats uh, the data to the way Sparks likes it and send the data back to the master. So the master is completely unaware that this is not all of the data that the worker sent. So this is entirely transparent to Spark. Yeah? What information the switch has that the worker do not have, that they cannot do it by themselves? Nothing. You can do everything on the worker, but here it would run on CPU, and here it would run on the uh, switch hardware. How much cycles do you have to spare uh, typically? What do you mean? I mean, you want to use the computation power of the switch. How, how, how loaded is it typically? How? Sorry? What's the size of the load on the switch? So the switch will see all of the data. So I'm not trying to no, understand no, the question. How hard is the switch working anyway? I mean, how much computation power does it have to spare? You did it in Okay, so the question is maybe the switch is already doing something else. Um, I mean, this is not something the switch was designed to do. Yeah, true. Um, so we have a way to um, fine tune the algorithms to use any amount of resources you can. And this is like a best effort um, thing, right? So if we are able to prune anything, then great. Otherwise, we don't lose a lot because the, these uh, modules are really lightweight. Okay, uh, so let me give you an example of a pruning algorithm. And let's go back to the distinct query, right? So we want to do something like, uh, let's say we have, sorry? Uh, I was just wondering, can yeah. you, in the kind of operations you described for the switch, they can do something like uh, linear sketches? Um, you can. People have implemented count means sketch on the switch. Um, but more complex sketches, it will be hard. So that's not. Uh, so I'll go into examples of how we run algorithms on the switch. All right, so the first example is this distinct query, right? So we want to compute the set of sellers, let's say, in the large table of products. Right? So each product have a seller, but maybe some sellers have multiple products, and we want to compute the set of sellers. So an intuitive idea is that if we can represent the set of sellers that we saw so far on the switch, now, if we see a new seller, if it's in this set, right, if we've seen it before, we can prune the packet, and otherwise we will forward it to the master. Right? But one problem is that we have limited amount of memory, so we need somehow to encode it in a smart way. So a reasonable idea, or what people usually think of, is to use a Bloom filter. Right? A Bloom filter is an encoding of a set that saves memory. Does anyone see the problem here? With Sorry? You need memory to store the... I need memory. The switch has some memory, so I can tune how big the bloom filter is. But yeah, the problem is false positives. Um, so false positives here would mean that there's some seller that we haven't seen before, but the bloom filter reports that it's a hit. Right? And if we prune this seller, we will not get the right output. So we cannot uh, use any uh, data structure with false positives. So you can actually also remove the works from the uh, workers. So what we do for this type of query, if it's that simple, we would not run anything on the worker. So the worker would send all of the data. Uh, and I'll get to that in a bit. Even in the individual data set, you would do the distinct only on the, only on the switch? The switch and master. Um, yeah, so we want somehow to encode the set on the switch without false positives. So we can use a cache, and specifically, we can implement an LOU cache on the switch. Um, so we can cache some items, and then if a new item comes in, if it's in the cache, then we can prune it, and otherwise we cannot. Why is that a problem? So the problem here is not correctness. This would work, and we, we will not uh, prune anything. We shouldn't. But the problem is that we have limited number of stages, like let's say 10 stages. So this would be a very small cache, and we won't be able to prune almost anything. 
Uh, so what we ended up doing is something we call multi-row LIU cache or limited associativity LIU cache. So um, every packet that comes in, we're going to hash on its seller or key, and it's going to go into one of many small caches, right? So even though we only uh, compare the item to 10 other items, we can still get reasonable size cache. And this allows us to prune almost all of the duplicates, so it depends how much uh, memory you're willing to allocate to the algorithm. Let me give you another example. Uh, let's say that we want to find the top N, or in this example, the 100 most expensive products in the table. Right? So one thing we can do is we can implement something like a rolling minimum. We can store the largest item on the first stage, the second largest on the second stage, and so on. But again, the problem here is that we don't have a lot of stages. So this would work if N is small. But if N is 100, 1,000, more than that, uh, this wouldn't work. We have tens of stages at most. Um, so here what we ended up doing is randomly partitioning the space. So whenever a packet comes in, we're going to send it into one of many rows at random. Each row is going to be, let's say, 10 stages or 10 items. And we're going to prune a packet only if it is smaller than um, all the other items in its row. And this is a probabilistic algorithm, right? We try to say something like, uh, we will prune this entry if it is smaller than 10 other entries. And we want the top 100, so there's going to be some chance of failure here. Um, but if you give me n and you tell me what is your desired success probability, let's say 99.99%, uh, we can uh, tune this matrix. We can configure how many uh, rows and columns. And by itself is not too interesting because I can just use all of the memory and hopefully not prune any of the items I need. Um, but the trick here is really to set it to a small size that we will maximize the pruning um, while meeting these constraints. And it turns out there's a unique solution to how to set the metrics to uh, maximize the expected pruning rate. OK, so when we benchmark Cheetah, right, and Cheetah is the one um, here, uh, we now uh, reduced almost all of the computation um, in the execution time. And the reason is we also removed the UDF from the workers or run a really lightweight UDF on the workers. So this is why uh, we don't spend a lot of time on computation, but we spend a lot more time on the network. And the reason is because we don't run the UDF, we don't reduce the amount of data on the worker, we're going to send much more data from the worker. So overall, we saw um, improvement, but now the new bottleneck is the network, and hopefully the network will um, become faster over time, um, faster than the CPU. So this should give us a better trade-off. So what a, yeah. זה עובר ב-CPU, אנחנו משתמשים ב-DPDK כדי לנסות לייצר פקטות. קשה להאמין שאיכשהו שמעבד של הסוויץ' עושה עבודה יותר טובה בסינון הזה מאשר המעבד של ה... So the way these switches work is that they're designed for fixed latency. So it doesn't really matter what you're going to compute on the switch. They would have the exact same latency. So the latency of each stage is bounded. And this is why you also have uh, limited support for uh, the different operations you can do on it. Um, so the switch is going to work at the same rate. Whatever you can put on the switch. <laughs> אבל עוד 
שאלה לגבי, אתה אומר שהפקטות, הלייטנסי שלהם הוא קבוע, אבל פה זה נראה שהזמן יתארך. הזמן יתארך because I'm sending more packets. The workers in Cheetah are not running the UDF or running different UDF that's much more lightweight. So we are not reducing um, the amount of data we send over the network as much as Spark does. Maybe even increasing? It's not increasing. So we either pack all of the data of the workers that started in its memory or we reduce it a little bit, right? But we don't reduce it as much as Spark does, and this is why we spend more time on sending the packets. Yes, so we have uh, different algorithms. Uh, I'm not trying to understand the question, but what we can do is we can uh, put data structures for all the different queries on the hardware at the same time, so you don't have to reprogram the switch once you get the query from the user. Was that the question? Yeah. Okay, so what else do we have in the paper? We have a bunch more algorithms um, for all of the popular uh, query operations in SQL. We have a new networking protocol, and the reason for that is that Spark is running over TCP, and TCP is a protocol uh, that ensures reliability in that like every worker would send a packet and will wait to get an acknowledgement that the packet was received, and otherwise it will retransmit it. And here, the switch is going to prune packets, so we don't want these transmissions. Right? So we needed a new networking protocol. And we also have a support for uh, more complex queries. So if you think of actual queries, then they don't look as simple as the ones that I just showed you. They look something like this. And this is an actual query from a benchmark we're working with. Uh, so here we have a group by and top n, if you also think of it, and some filtering and computation. And when we try to accelerate something like this, um, so it's all about how to partition the work between the workers and the switch. So we're not going to offload all of the functionality to the switch. We want to decide which parts to offload to the switch. And this is done in the query planning. OK, so I'm going to go into network telemetry. And the way um, people usually work with it is they collect the telemetry. They can later analyze it um, using Spark or any other um, system. But now I'm going to talk to you about a project that actually tries to collect the data from the network. Right? And before I'm going to go into our solution, I'm going to tell you a bit about the current standard or the emerging standard. And this one's already using programmable switches. And it's called INT, in-band network telemetry. And the idea is very simple. We want to get information out of the switches. So we can just put them on the packets. Right? So let's say that we want to uh, get the path that the packet is taken, or the latency, or anything else. Uh, we can just encode it on the packets. Now, let's say that this is the path that the packet is taken. The first hop is, and we're going to call it the INT source. The last hop is the INT sync. And what the INT source is doing is it installs a new header. It's called the INT header, which is um, basically an information that would tell the other hops on the path, also the sync, what type of information we're trying to collect. Is it latency, switch ID, buffer information, or anything else? So we install this header on the INT source. And we let's say we want to collect um, the path information, the switch IDs, so we can also write the um, switch ID on the first hop. It goes to the second hop. It can read what information we're trying to collect. It can add it, its own identifier and so on um, until the packet reaches the INT sync. And the INT sync extracts this information. No, not necessarily. There's a maximum length for it, um, but not fixed length. But using the data that you So this is in band, so it's actually piggybacking to the existing packets. Um, but the INT sync removes this information, right? So this protocol is transparent to both sender and receiver. And now that we have this information, we can analyze it, maybe send it to Spark or any other um, way of analyzing it. 
and spot, and INT is really general, right? You can add a lot of different information on these packets. You can add latency measurements, um, buffer measurements, and things like that. It's already running um, in production in major companies. Alibaba are using it in the data centers, and they're basing um, another uh, other applications on that. Like they're running their congestion control. Uh, based on INT, and congestion control is the problem of determining the sending rate for each connection in the network. And the idea is that we don't want to overwhelm the network and cause packet drops. Um, so they are using INT to collect information and set the sending rate. But INT is also expensive, right? And any type of information that we want to add in INT, and this is hard coded in the INT standard is going to add four bytes per hop, like switch ID four bytes per hop, latency four bytes per hop, and so on. So why do we care about it? Well, even if you think of short passes, let's say five hops, um, the overall overhead is going to be 28 bytes. So it's eight bytes for the header and four bytes per hop. And we ran an experiment um, adding this overhead uh, to packets. And this is the good put, let's say, um, the performance of the large flows in the network, and we saw that it really degrades uh, the more information you add to it. So here the y-axis is the good put or the performance, and uh, the x-axis is corresponds to adding one information type, two, three, four, or five, um, in this five hops path, right? Yeah? In 90, they add to every packet. Why? This is the standard. So that's the way the standard works, but also if you think of uh, the congestion control algorithm that uh, Alibaba is running, and they actually published it, they use the information to fine tune the sending rate on every packet they receive. So they actually use it on every packet. But does it change so uh, rapidly? I mean, between like, I mean, I know nothing about it. That sounds strange, you know? Like if, if the congestion is low, then like after five packets, uh, it could be. So one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why their congestion control is better than uh, other congestion control algorithms is that it doesn't have to wait round trip time before it gets feedback. So for every packet it gets the information and they actually show that it improved a lot, um, the congestion control. Yes, but also, like I said, for congestion control, they actually show that if you get the information for every packet, it's much better than if you get it once in every RTT, which is <coughs> probably 40 packets, 50 packets on average. OK, so what we propose is PINT, or probabilistic INT. And the goal here is really to minimize the bit overhead um, while encoding this telemetry information. And the framework is as follows. So we're going to assume that whenever a packet gets to a switch, it's going to observe something that we call a value. And this value can be either one of the uh, information types in INT, like uh, latency or queue information. It can be switch ID. Uh, but it can also be any function that the switch can compute. So the only assumption is that the switch uh, can compute it when it gets the packet. And we have two types of aggregations that we support in Pint. The first is a per packet aggregation, um, which is basically we can take like the sum or max or min over uh, the values that a packet is seeing. But more challenging um, is the per flow aggregation, where we have a flow. And a flow is like a connection in the network. Right? And it's going to have multiple packets. And what we want to do per flow is if uh, the data is static, so you can think of it maybe as the switch configuration or the access control list, or maybe just like the switch ID, if we want to understand what's the path taken by a flow. So in this case, we just want to read this configuration or path ID information uh, for every switch on the path. And we also consider the dynamic case where the values are changing between packets. Um, and still, if we are looking at a specific switch, and let's say the values are like latency, 
we can ask what's the median latency or tail latency and other functions um, that we care about. So I'm going to give you uh, two use cases for that. One is congestion control. And I already mentioned that Alibaba are using it um, in production. And they do it by collecting latency and queue information. And then they decide how to fine tune the sending rate. Um, but it turns out that while you cannot actually um, compute the quantity that HPCC cares about when um, defining the sending rate, uh, you can approximate it at the switch. And this means that now we can just take the max over, like the per packet max um, for each packet over this uh, approximated values. And this allows us to tune the sending rate. So we will just get this information and decide at which rates to send. And this actually improves HPCC, like uh, the Alibaba solution. And the reason is uh, the price we pay for this approximation is not as critical as reducing the bit overhead. I'm going to give you a second use case. I'm going to talk about uh, path profiling or detecting paths. Yeah. yeah. Why do you use max maximum sum? Sum would not be better. So intuitively, you care about the bottleneck when you want to. Okay, so the second use case, I'm going to talk about path profiling, but with more changes, this is actually our algorithm for the static case that I mentioned. And in path profiling, uh, what we care about is figuring out the path that the flow is taking, right? So the values here would just be the switch IDs. We want to find out the path. And INT is doing that by adding all of the um, hop information to each packet. And we want to do it with uh, less overhead. So we have a solution to do it with any overhead that you um, would give us, like maybe even one bit. But let's assume for now that we're willing to encode one switch ID on each packet. Right? And if we're willing to encode one switch ID, um, an intuitive idea is that we can just sample uh, one hop along the path. And we can encode it on the packet. Um, and then we can figure out the path once we get samples from each hop. And this was already proposed before. So uh, we can actually use a field on the packet header that is called the TTL, or time to leave field, uh, to figure out what is the current hop number. So like B would know that it is the second hop. Um, and then we can run an algorithm called reservoir sampling and get that we sample each hop with the same probability, like one in four in this example. So maybe the first packet would come with the identifier C. And then we get a bunch more packets. And then at some point, um, we get at least one sample from each hop. And we are able to um, decode the path. So the question here is, how many packets we need before we can decode the path? And this is called the coupon collector process, right? So the coupons here would be, um, let's say, the switch IDs. And every time we get a sample, and it is known that the number of samples you would need for collecting k coupons, let's say we have k hops on the path, it would be something like k lang k. Right, so this is going to be the baseline for us. Um, and what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give you another algorithm that's actually going to work worse than the straw man. Right? So it's going to require more packets than this uh, sampling algorithm. Um, but then we will show that the combination of the two give us better performance. And not only is this algorithm going to require more packets, it also makes assumptions um, that the previous algorithm didn't need. The first one is that we know something that we call a typical length of a path. And let's say this is 10 hops, then the passes in the network can be, let's say, 30 hops or 3 hops, but they shouldn't be 10,000 hops. Right? So it should be up to a constant factor the actual length of the path. And we also uh, assume that the packets have unique identifiers. right? So we have some identifier that is unique across all packets. And the way this new algorithm, this EXO algorithm, work is very simple. So with a probability of 1 over d, each switch for each packet is going to XOR its identifier on the packet. Um, but we're not going to do this uh, by flipping coins or drawing random bits of the switches. Uh, we're going to use some global hash function. 
h, that is a function of the packet identifier and the time to live or the uh, hop identifier. Um, and this means that if we have a packet that was axled by the first and second hop, so the pint sync can check this function and figure out that it was axled by hops one and two. Right, so maybe on the second hop, only C exoed it, maybe you got unlucky on the third hop and no one exoed it, and so on. Um, but what is nice here is that if we take these two packets, for example, we can figure out that the identifier of the fourth hop is D because we already know that the third hop is C. Right, so this is how the algorithm progresses. And I'm not going to show you the analysis, but we can show it's a constant factor worse than the original algorithm, like maybe it required three times more packets. Um, so I'm going to give you an intuition to why the combination of the two would give us better results. So what we see here uh, is the coupon collector process. The y-axis is the expected number of missing halves, like the number of switch ASDs that we don't have yet. The x-axis is the number of samples or how many packets we got to the pint thing. And what is important here is that if we look at, let's say, the first uh, 40 packets, um, we are actually able to, to decode most of the hops, let's say 20 out of the 25 hops, um, which is the pass length in this example. Now, what if at this point we would switch to the XOR algorithm, but we're going to XOR not with probability 1 over 25, we're going to XOR with probability 1 over 5. Right, so what we're going to get is that the probability of getting uh, new hop information on each consecutive packet is going to increase and we're going to get better performance. Um, but there's no reason to stop here, right? So we see here the same behavior. So in the beginning, the XOR algorithm performs well and then it slows down. So we can repeat this process. So we can um, stop this again and then start a new XOR algorithm with an even higher probability. Right, so this is um, like the intuition. This is not an actual algorithm. We cannot switch between the algorithms like that. Let me explain uh, the actual algorithm. And what we do is um, each switch for every packet with some probability tau, we're going to run the original coupon collector algorithm. And if not, we're going to have a bunch of these XO algorithms, um, and we're going to choose one of them at random. And the XO instances are different from each other in the probabilities that we use. So when optimizing this uh, algorithm, so the parameters here are this tau and these probabilities for the XOR, we can show that the number of packets we would need to decode a k hops pass now actually reduces to something like k times log of log star k plus 2 plus small o1. So log of log star k is a function that grows extremely slowly, so it's going to be at most two, like the number of atoms in the universe. Um, and this small o1 means this is like an additive term that is sublinear in k. Uh, so this is uh, the pint algorithm, and I'm going to give you a few thoughts. Uh, yeah. Do you have any low bounds? So the low. So the lower bound would be k, um, and I think in some cases you can get to order of k. So if we know the exact pass length in advance, we can get to order of k packets. But otherwise, uh, this is the best we know how to do. Um, yeah, if you can uh, determine which is the one that's going to write this in. I don't understand. Earlier you had like three folds from here, and then you had three, so from that you reduced to four. You don't take more complicated So what you want to try to do is you want to set the probability for the XOR so that exactly one unknown hop would no, XOR it. You don't take, you know, combination, just combination of two. 
No, no. So every, ho every switch is going to independently decide whether to XOR or not. So there can be many oh, switches right. XORing. So the result, the multi combination, but when you get all the results, mm -hmm. you don't look for a solution to a system finite equation, but you just look for things that are distance one from each other. What solution for the writer to look at distance two? So you could look at a solution for uh, linear equations. Um, this is more computationally expensive, right, than something like this. OK, um, so I'm going to give you a few thoughts um, going forward. And I know that a lot of you are working on theory and um, CPU and DRAM machines. And I really think that um, it it's worthwhile to look at these new hardware targets. I think there are very interesting algorithmic challenges there. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So maybe we can also replace the Sparks Query Planner, um, which is still, like even in Cheetah, we do it in software. Maybe we can replace it with the switch to do everything um, on the switches. Mm -hmm. And in INT or Pine, so currently the way INT works is that they're sending the telemetry information that they collect to uh, software processing. Maybe we can also uh, analyze that on the switches. Um, but also, we want to find the right partitioning between software and hardware, right? So we touch it a little bit in Cheetah, but um, if 10 or 20 years from now, all of the systems we care about are going to work with a combination of hardware and, and software, we want to find the right balance between the two. And finally, I think we should co-design um, hardware, software, and algorithms. And what I mean by that is what we did in these two projects is we took a pizza switch off the box and used it. Um, but we should actually influence the way we design these hardware switches. And this is something we already do. So we are now in touch with uh, one of the switch vendors in the US. And we try to tell them what hurts us the most, like which limitations are bad for us. And hopefully, um, maybe on the next generation of switches, uh, they'll be able to solve this. Um, and if you have any other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.